Hello and welcome to one of three webcasts on work and breast cancer. Something that has come out from our members are a real need and it's a delight today to be looking at the issues of those women and men who've been diagnosed with breast cancer who are self-employed. My name is Kirsten Pilati. I'm the very proud CEO of Breast Cancer Network Australia. Before we get underway, I would like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are part of our network. To those who are elders and those who are coming as leaders, we thank you for your commitment to BCNA. So first of all, I want to welcome Danelle Katajar, who will talk to us from a consumer's perspective, and Michael Bates, who is a lawyer, and we've asked him to maybe give us some direct answers today, a challenge for most lawyers as in the legal can, system. As best I can. So uh, thank you both for joining us. As we've said, today is all about uh, the, the information that those people who have been diagnosed, men and women, who are self-employed, who, who deal with many different challenges. So Janelle, I want to start with you first. Um, can you tell us a bit about your breast cancer experience and, and uh, what happened with you? Yep, sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me today um, to talk with you and Michael. Um, my personal breast cancer story began in March 2015. Uh, I was diagnosed with stage three uh, breast cancer. Um, within two weeks of diagnose, diagnose, diagnosis, um, I undertook a skin sparing mastectomy and had a tissue expander put in place. Um, the surgeon also removed approximately 10 lymph nodes from under my arm. Um, a few weeks later, I had the opportunity of opting into a clinical trial, uh, which then led me on a chemotherapy journey of 15 months. So from April 2015, um, with the last chemotherapy session ending in July 2016. Um, after the chemo had finished, uh, the next step for me was uh, radiotherapy, which was every day for five weeks. Um, then after much consideration, uh, I made the decision to um, uh, remove my remaining breast and undergo a DEP flap uh, reconstruction for both breasts at the same time. So this was completed in uh, March 2017. Um, I ended up going back a few months later as I required more tissue um, extracted from another part of the body um, to be inserted into the breast again. And at the same time, I had uh, nipple uh, construction for both breasts. Um, then finally, I, in, uh, at the end of 2018, I had um, uh, the, are the areola uh, tattoo, um, which was grey. Like, it was, it was the best, um, you know, being at the end, finally. Um, at the time of being diagnosed though, my husband and I had a small business that we had been running for 19 years. We uh, contributed to our super fund during this time, uh, but we didn't have income protection in place as far as I knew. Um, this contributed to a lot of stress um, as the both of us were required to work in the business. We both had different roles. Um, we had uh, three dependent children at the time and a mortgage to look after. Um, it was a very stressful time. So yeah. thanks so much. And we're going to delve into, if it's okay with you, a yeah, bit sure. more of the detail. And uh, I think importantly, it's about you reflecting on what you've learned and mm. what you can pass on mm. to others. Yep. Uh, Michael Bates, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank some you. of you may have seen you on the 7.30 report as you uh, led some of the legal work mm. against Common Shore, which- And uh, Four Corners. And Four Corners mm. um, around the importance of making sure that uh, companies, uh, insurance companies are providing access for cancer patients. Can you tell us a bit about you, uh, where you're from and sure. your kind of expertise in this area? Sure. Well, so I, I deal only with insurance in superannuation. Um, so that there are a number of different types of uh, insurance. There's what's called total and permanent disability. There's death, there's terminal illness benefits, there's income protection, as Danelle said, um, and you can have trauma uh, insurance as well. There, it's, 
it really is peeling an onion. And this is uh, you know, one of the, the problems or one of the issues when you hear about this, or, and certainly even listening to your story, Danelle, is things never run as smoothly as you think. Well, first, I think probably first and foremost, you never expect that this is going to happen to you. Yeah. You've got a mortgage, you've got kids, you've got every, everything that happens um, in your world and then all of a sudden life throws a curveball at you and uh, the, you, you don't deal with it in a way where you go in on one day and you're out the next day and it's all done. Yeah. Um, so that I deal with and I act for people who are facing those problems in their life where they can't uh, make ends meet and they've got insurance policies and the insurance company may be saying, well, we don't think you satisfy the definition. And uh, a lot of people get confused about superannuation uh, or insurance attached to superannuation because they think that the superannuation is it, which is the contributions, the percentage of uh, what your employer or if you're self-employed, what you should be paying. And we, mm -hmm. we talked earlier about Danelle saying she didn't pay as a self-employed person, didn't pay um, her own super, but uh, the insurance component is completely separate. And yeah, again, we could probably sit here for hours, but we mm. won't. So um, uh, your legal firm, Beryl Watson Lawyers, has taken many cases around um, uh, insurances. These are big multinational companies, um, often that we're trying to deal with. What's your first tip about that that moment in time that you're diagnosed um, and what advice would you give to someone who's firstly diagnosed about what they should be looking for in their policy areas? Sure. So like a lot of these things, and again, earlier we were talking about super, only because I work in the area do I know this, but superannuation to me was otherwise something that you may get when you reach retirement age. Uh, and of course, the human condition is what it is and that doesn't always happen. So uh, we have in this country a great superannuation system and what comes with it a lot of the time is an automatic insurance cover. Now that automatic insurance cover, so each time your employer makes contributions, um, you can have, or what, what are, is deducted from those contributions is insurance premiums and that leads to you having insurance cover. Now, uh, most superannuation funds have what's called TPD or total and permanent disability cover and death cover. Uh, there is also available income protection cover. And the message really is know what insurances you have attached to your superannuation because it's a fantastic scheme to have insurance and you're not buying it uh, as an individual policy it's literally able to come out of the contributions that are being uh, made and going into your superannuation account. But people don't know about it. So um, let's stick on that super aspect first. Now you talked about um, that you weren't as a uh, your own business contributing to it because you were worrying about everyone, making mm. sure everyone else's super was paid for. How did you deal with some of those complexities post your diagnosis when you realised that you know, the importance of paying into that super? Yeah, the, the way that I, that we deal with it, um, it, it you just, you pay um, people in your business before you pay yourself. And, um, but now looking back at it, um, you know, we are as important as our employees were, um, but, it's very hard in small business to, um, you know, uh, have that money flow to be able to um, pay yourself. You, you put yourself um, second compared to your employees. Yeah. So one of the very interesting things about your story is that uh, you kind of looked in, into the super and your insurances that are in that immediate aspect of your life. Yes until a fortuitous mail came. Yes. Tell us about that and in particular what kind of messages we can give to other people about knowing what else is, you've got. So when I first looked at the super that um, we had minimum, you know, put a minimal amount of money into um, over the 19 years that we had the business, um, I, I looked at that one first and, and thought, 
we haven't got um, income protection. It, I can't find it anywhere in the um, in what I was in my statements and in what I was reading. Um, so I did contact them, and um, and they um, also said there was no income protection uh, policy in, in within that super. Um, and, and that I couldn't claim any, any of it at all. So um, about 12 weeks later, I received a letter um, and prior, it, within, uh, you know, I think it was 2013, I did have a part-time job um, and they had their own super, um, which I had forgotten about at the time of diagnosis. Um, anyway, I received a letter and um, a, a statement from this super fund and immediately opened up the letter and, um, and saw straight away on that statement um, that I had income protection, um, which was like, it was a blessing in, in, at that time. And um, so I contacted them and I had to wait a, a period of 90 days before I could claim. But it was it saved us, um, you know. It, it um, saved a lot of a lot of stress. Yeah. So, Michael, there has been some changes in Australia around the legislation of access to superannuation of late, in that people need to keep their accounts active Correct. around yeah. superannuation. Mm. Can you just talk briefly about how that might be impacting people today and what they need to look out for? Sure. So, the current government has introduced. Uh, legislation and they're dealing with what they call uh, small accounts which so accounts less than six thousand dollars they're saying uh, if no contribution has been received and if it, I think it's for 16 months or 18 months uh, they will uh, cancel that insurance and uh, there was a cutoff date um, of the 1st of July gone just now it moved very quickly and um, uh, super funds le sent letters out uh, on mass to say listen you have a superannuation account that is going to be impacted by this legislative change and you're going to lose your insurance. And uh, again, Danelle and I were talking about this earlier and that is that people don't understand that, uh, uh, you know, they could have two, three, four different insurance policies under their um, superannuation if they've got two, three, four different super funds. Uh, we're not all, uh, you know, amazing when we get home with our admin and it can mean that, you know, we had a, a job uh, for a period of months and then we decided to go somewhere else and uh, we had one super fund that was open and contributed to during that job and then we went somewhere else and another super fund and it could well mean that those uh, you could have a number of different insurance benefits. Now, uh, as it relates to income protection, that's not the case. So uh, if you've got income protection on two policies, uh, the way that works is income protection will pay 75% or usually 75%, could be 85% of your pre-disability earnings over the 12 months previous to your stopping work. Uh, but you can't get two lots of income protection. Whereas if you've got total and permanent disability cover, which pays as a lump sum, you could have four lump sum benefits payable. Wow. So, and you know, this can make a big difference. So how do you find out where, if, if you're not great at admin, where, yeah, where well, do you start? Well, you get, superannuation funds send you a statement every 12 months, at least, and if you're anything like me, uh, you know, the, the mechanic who drives around with the worst car because he spends his whole day working on cars, <laughs> is uh, you get it and put it, you know, in the filing cabinet and never look at it again. But that statement will have a, a glossy uh, brochure and it will talk about the investment returns and it will have pictures of people in suits and the work they've done for your money and you won't read it because nobody ever does. And But attached will be a statement and it will show your account balance and somewhere on that statement it will have, or should have, um, is somewhere total and permanent disability, death insurance and there will be a figure there. And of course you may have opted out of insurance but it's automatic at the moment. Uh, and so therefore if you've signed up to an employer it's certainly more than likely the case that you will have insurance. And so if you um, have a self-employed yes. and you've signed up to super, that would also be the case unless you're opting out for it. That's right. The, there is one really difficult issue and that is with self-employed. And 
as I think you said, we could talk about this for hours, yeah. but uh, when you are um, self-employed and you have employees that you need to look after, and as Danelle said, she paid superannuation to them before herself, um, you, if you lodge a claim because you say, well, I'm, I'm unwell and I can't work, but at the same time, if you don't uh, go to the payroll computer and p make the payroll so your staff get paid, you run into this significant problem, and it's a significant problem for a lot of self-employed people, uh, which is, well, I can't work. I'm, I'm not doing the duties that I was doing before I got sick, but I don't have anyone else to do this. So, uh, but of course, an insurance company doesn't hear that. What they hear is you're trying to make a claim because you're saying that you're unwell yeah. and can't work, but you are actually working. And uh, So what advice do you give to people on that? You can say to an insurance company, and if you uh, have your doctor's support, you can say, well, look, the duties I was doing before my diagnosis was A, B, C, and D. I'm doing half of A, you know, now. And then it, 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 you don't see me after I've done that, you know. I drag myself to the computer, yeah. I guess it's about that risk analysis of how much do you need the money to be able to continue to survive on versus um, the element of holding on to the baby. So, do you know what, what was the hardest part for you of being self-employed and being diagnosed with breast cancer? I think with regards to um, having your own business, it's, it's extremely hard if you have employees that are dependent on you. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, you don't want to let them down, so which drives you to, um, you know, do what you have to do within the business, even though you're, you are unwell. Um, you somehow continue to, to motivate yourself and, um, and get up and, and just do it. Um, because, you know, you, like I said, you don't want to let them down. You, you can't. And it makes you feel better. Yeah. You've, you've got meaning yeah. as well. A absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I think um, that's a good thing. Um, I don't think that's bad at all. Um, I, I really believe that we all need that purpose um, to um, get better, mm. really. Absolutely, yeah. there's something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, Michael, you've supported a lot of patients over the time. One of the things that just keeps coming up is the real challenge of actually dealing with the insurance companies. Um, and so have you got any really practical tips about things to get ready before you're even having that first conversation with them around the access? Your doctor support is so important. You know, that's key. Uh, and your doctor, I've never come across a doctor who works in oncology in this area that, that's not supportive. They are amazing. Um, but uh, that, that is cert well, certainly number one. Number two, uh, there are people, BCNA know this stuff, there are people out there that can, can assist you even if it's just a fact sheet or um, yeah, some information over the phone. Always, when you're dealing with um, insurance companies, please put it in writing. Uh, it, you know, we now live in a world where we all have emails. Uh, it, it's time and time again we have uh, clients who say to me, or that come to me after they've tried to lodge the claim themselves and they say, well, I spoke with this person and they said this is what was going to happen and this is how long and this is the rest of it and um, none of that's happened. And I say, okay, well, do you have it in writing? And they're like, well, no, I don't. And in fact, I can't remember who it was, I you know, this type of thing. So um, by all means, ring these companies, ask for claim forms to be sent to you, uh, but, and you, you may be allocated a case manager, but any conversation you have with the case manager, follow it up in writing because they say they record the conversations, but... It's there's... hard to find when they're being challenged. That's exactly right. Yeah, and exactly. I think that, you know, as somebody said in, on our online community, they'll do everything to not pay. And so mm. if you go in with the right kind of mental um, strength of they're going to do everything to not pay, so therefore I have to have dotted all the I's and crossed That's, all the yeah. T's. Yeah. But, um, just what before we leave you on this one, Michael, what if... Uh, the small business is just a husband and wife and he wants to be there for all of her appointments. Is there any access uh, abilities around um, 
for maybe it's not personal insurance, maybe it's company insurance or... Well, there is, and uh, I, I didn't mention this earlier and I was going to. So there is what's called business interruption insurance. That is an insurance that is available um, for your business. So, uh, and the way that works is if you're not able to work and it, it can be anything from, you know, catastrophic events like a flood that, that prevent you have to shut your business down um, or illness like this. So what happens, you uh, take out an insurance policy. Um, they then, if you're not able to work, you provide your financials to the insurance company and they pay you a uh, proportion of, of that, whether it's 75% or otherwise, um, you know, based on your previous earnings. Yep. So that's, that's terrific. Uh, the other thing that hasn't been mentioned as well is you can get mortgage protection insurance. So you have a mortgage, you've got to make your mortgage repayments. If you can't make those mortgage repayments because of sickness, your mortgage protection uh, insurance will cover those. But again, this is perfect world stuff. Yeah. It's like someone saying to you, read the fine print. Yeah. You know, we don't read the fine print. That's why uh, automatic insurance cover is terrific. Danelle, I'm not sure you even knew at the time that you had it or, you know, so many yeah. people don't. And that's why it's such a great product. Yeah. But we, you know, we are, uh, in Australia constantly hear that we're underinsured. Um, and perhaps that is the case, but it's, uh, you know, we just don't turn our minds to, and I think it's because we all have optimism and hope that nothing's going to happen that's to us. And right, yeah. that's not necessarily yeah. a bad thing, but sometimes. Um, Michael, I think there's the, um, I do want to come back to the income protection and the timing aspect from people being diagnosed. It's my understanding that you can actually go back after you've finished your treatment and still access some absolutely. of your, yeah. So yeah, tell us a bit about can. that. So people think that because that period is gone, so they fell on hard times, uh, weren't able to work for say you know, four years, three years, uh, and then have managed to get back to work. If they have an income protection policy, they can go back and revisit that um, and bring a claim for that period if they can show that uh, a, yes, they were suffering from the condition that led to their uh, not being able to work and they've got their doctor's support and B, that there's a clear um, proof, documentary proof that they weren't working. So um, it's not, don't just think, oh, well, look, I should have, I wish I'd known at the time, um, but mm. as it turns out, I'm good now and I'm back working. You may be sitting on two, three, four, five, yeah, these insurance um, income protection policies can pay between two, five, can pay benefits up to 65. So it's potentially open to you. There are, um, and again, without being a lawyer, but limitations, statute of limitations issues sometimes, but the, the answer to that stuff is that contact the BCNA if you're unsure, because if you're sitting on a policy and you've got two or three years of insurance benefit, and but you're back working, take it and go on a holiday. So Danelle, let's um, put the insurance stuff behind us for one second or to the side. Uh, the most successful uh, small businesses are people who are delivering to clients. Mm -hmm. Did you tell your clients about your diagnosis? Mm -hmm. And tell, talk a bit about that, like the pros and cons, do you yeah. think, of full disclosure? Yeah. Um, no, I did not um, tell our clients because I thought that um, we would probably lose business if, if I did. Um, only because I think people might have thought maybe we can't, we wouldn't be able to fulfil um, the job that we were doing for them, um, and and also um, people might think you know um, oh, I, I don't want to bother them um, with my business. I'll go somewhere else because you know she she's getting she's you know got breast cancer or, and she wants to get well, so I'm not going to bother her. So. That's the reasons why um, I think, uh, yeah, just, you know, looking. At now, that. now looking back, mm. do people know now that you had breast cancer? Yes. And have you been, um, have, uh, have they reacted differently to how you would have expected? Um, yeah, like everybody, I think, would have been supportive. Um, I, I think... Like, I didn't think of that at that time. I just thought, oh, no, I don't want to lose their business. Yeah. Not thinking that they would react, um, you know, like, oh, no, you, you, we will give you our business. And it, it could have created more business in, in lots of ways. 
Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's pros and cons always mm. because just like friendship groups that are mm. sometimes there for you yeah. at a time of crisis and then others who you think were, mm. were definitely going to be there just mm. go missing in action. So I'm yeah. sure that that's kind of amplified from a client's yes. perspective. Yeah. Um, we know that there are, you know, there's the, that point of treatment and acti- what we call active treatment. Um, for those people with early breast cancer. And then, you know, the doctors say to them, we've given you everything. Now, you know, continue taking your hormone blocking therapy that will uh, cause no end of side effects, but go back and go back into the world. What are some of the um, uh, things that might be available to people, Michael, who are struggling with returning to work, but they're not in treatment? You can apply, you can make application for uh, payments of your superannuation. If you don't have insurance uh, attached to your uh, superannuation, you can make application on compassionate grounds for some money under your account balance. Um, So if you need certain things because of um, your situation, um, you know, for example, you need modifications to your home um, because of you know, whatever is uh, your health problem, if you're in a wheelchair, for example, um, you know, that that can happen. So now what what advice do you give others around this? You're, you're through your active treatment. Yeah. Um, you're now making pink lady uh, mm-hmm. gingerbread biscuits for BCNA yes. as, a, as a great mm-hmm. um, supporter of ours. Mm-hmm. What advice now do you give to people mm-hmm. who are trying to get back to work? Um, I just think, you know, you need to definitely check your superannuation <laughs> details. Um, check your policy and um, but in regards to getting better, you, you just need to take one day at a time um, and, um, you know, just take all the help you can get um, within your business and, and on a personal level as well. And reaching out, did you reach out to others to um, get support who were other self-employed? Um, no, not really. Um, I think, you know, at the time we thought, no, we can do this, you know, we're going to do it all out on our own. Um, but I would suggest to, t- to get it out there and, and seek other people's help because uh, people want to help. Mm. Yeah. What about, uh, sorry, I, and we didn't talk about this earlier, but as a, you're now making, and I didn't know this, mm-hmm. you're making uh, Pink yeah. Ladies, but was that... Your involvement now with BCNA, uh, was this something that happened at the time um, and you reached out and mm-hmm. found out a fantastic community of women mm-hmm. and were able to get the information or was it the case that you didn't and you've now stumbled onto it having gone through what you've gone through and gone, actually people need to know about this. Mm-hmm. Was it, was it yeah. the former or the latter? Yeah. It was a bit of both. I, um, when I was at home for the first three months, I... I was so used to being so busy, I thought, oh, well, what am I going to do? I just, you know, need to be busy. And uh, so there was a, my boys play football, so we had a, a fundraising um, event for, for that. So I made little cookies for that. And um, for, and that's where it took off. I just thought everybody loved them. And I thought, I, I wonder if I could, um, you know, donate those cookies uh, to BCNA and, um, and it took off from there. Yeah, and if you've ever been to any of our events around the country, you will um, see Danelle's work. So what about the women and men who are living in our network with metastatic disease? Uh, It is a very different outlook. Uh, Obviously, I would encourage people to call Breast Cancer Network Australia to our helpline so we can help you to navigate the system. But the insurances and things are there for them as well. Absolutely. Uh, It used to be 12 months. Uh, You used to have to get uh, medical proof that you were going to pass away within 12 months. It's now changed to 24 months, uh, which is terrific. Uh, there is, I think, still some criticism about, uh, you know, the length of time that it can take. And I think even with uh, access to account balances, so which is a conditions of release issue um, that, and we talked earlier with Danelle uh, off camera and she talked about she wasn't able to get her account balance released on the grounds of incapacity because a doctor wasn't prepared to say that she would never work again. Um, But she was at that particular point in time facing some serious financial problems. 
business, mortgage, family. Uh, so yeah, there's work to be done here. Yeah. Um, but yes, terminal illness, it, it's terrific to see that that's changed to, to 24 months. Uh, and, you know, let's hope that we can continue we can, working yeah. in that area. So it's amazing how quickly time goes. But um, Danelle, I want to leave um, for you to kind of share your final reflections on what you would tell a younger self, yeah. what you'd d kind of do differently. I um, have thought about that. And if I was to have my time again, I would definitely make sure that I've got uh, income protection. I think, um, you know, when I was 20, I, you would never think that, you know, you would need income protection. Um, so I would definitely do that and, um, and uh, you know, seek someone like Michael to help you um, uh, sort out what's best for you because everybody is, is different. So um, that's what I would do. Awesome. Thank you both so much. I think I'm going to be able to wrap up. Oh, fingers crossed that I'll get it. But I, I think the top tips that have come out of today's session is the importance of doctor's support in any of your insurance claim, in understanding and gathering all of your policies together. And in fact, I met a wonderful woman in our network who said, you know, all these people want to help all the time after a diagnosis. So she just asked her mate, who was a financial planner, to find every single policy. She gathered them all up, handed them to him, and he read the fine print. Mm. And she has been able to access um, some drugs that are not on the PBS because he could understand the fine print and be able to maximise some of her insurances. So I think if you've got someone in your life or your accountant or your financial planner, then mm. give them all of uh, access to all of your policies uh, to make sure that you can really understand what is in the fine print. Um, put everything in writing to any yes. insurer or any bank. And I think it is important at this point that we encourage people to reach out to your bank. There are many pr um, programs within the big banks that uh, offer support, financial support for people, um, including putting credit cards, uh, balances on hold and, and other things like that. Um, and that it is never too late to go back to your policies and have a look at what you might be able to access. So uh, I hope that has been helpful. I would encourage you, if you've got any questions, to reach out to our helpline on 1800 500 258. Uh, our nurses there will help to navigate the system for you and put you on to programs and services that are available. I'd also love you to get onto the My Journey online tool where we have a whole lot more information around work and breast cancer, including some really important information for staff that you may have. So from all of us, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. if there's anything you need, we are here for you every step of the way. Thanks a lot.